So this year, my team played in Plat CTF 2019. We tend to play in Plat CTF almost every year, but usually we solve absolutely no challenges. This year, we actually solved a few, and I'm going to cover those in this video today. We are Samurai, the keyboard cowboys, and all those other people out there who have no idea what's going on are the cattle. Moo. So my team was the keyboard cowboys, and we finished in 200th place with 111 points. <laughs> so obviously, we're not that cut out for the CTF, but that doesn't mean we don't try anyway. Congratulations to the top three teams that won. Super smart. Can't wait to see you guys participate at the DEF CON CTF if you're there. For those of you who don't know, Plaid CTF is one of the few CTF uh, pre-qualifying events that allows you to automatically qualify for the DEF CON CTF finals. So, needless to say... This CTF gets really hard really fast and scales to challenge people of all different skill levels, um, especially those that are really good to get onto the on-site DEF CON CTF. The two main challenges that my team solved were Docker and Can You Guess Me. Docker was a little bit easier. However, if you didn't have any Docker experience, getting this challenge set up was kind of a pain. So hopefully that I'll be able to help educate some people on some basics around Docker in that regard. Can You Guess Me, however, was actually more of a programming slash pwn challenge. Not pwnable in the sense of, uh, you know, reverse engineering and binary exploitation, but it was pwnable in its own right. And it was an interesting uh, way where you had to exploit a misuse of an eval call in a Python script. So we'll go over both of those. Starting with Docker. When you open this challenge, the description is Docker pool, who would ever guess this slash public? Well, if you're familiar with Docker, you know this is a command to pull down a Docker container. So the Plaid CTF folks stood up a Docker container uh, in a public repo over here. So at this time, if you don't have Docker installed on your system and you're not familiar with that, it'd be a really good time to start Googling how to install Docker, especially if you're using like a default Kali install for your CTFs like many do. Um, just Google how to install uh, Docker for Kali and you'll be off to the races. Once you've got it set up, simply run that command, docker pool, who would ever guess this slash public. And this is going to pull down the latest Docker container from this repo. Now, to run this, there's a lot of things you can do. You can either create a new container from it, from the image, or you can um, run it straight from the image itself, which is actually what we're going to do. So if we run Docker images, it'll list our images for us. And now if we say Docker run, if I can spell, tech I, tech T, and we're going to paste in our container name. Now, what this, if we were to run this command as it is, it would actually just start our Docker container. However, we're running it in interactive mode. That's what that dash I uh, stands for. And we're wanting to execute a specific command. So if we run this uh, with the string tack I, tack T afterwards, we'll drop into a bash shell inside of this container so we can explore around. So that's usually my first reaction. And that's what both myself and one of my teammates did when we were trying to work on this challenge together. Once you're inside the Docker container, you should be presented with a root shell. And if you list out the contents of the slash directory where you start, you'll see there's actually a file called flag. We got it, right? Yeah, that's what we thought too. But when you cat the flag out, it says, I'm sorry, but your princess is in another castle. So obviously the flag's not here. Now, we spent a lot of time digging around inside the container, looking through different file systems. Uh, one common thing I like to do is do a find um, slash star and... Of course, that'll look for everything, but then I grep for, like, flag. And usually doing that will help you find the actual flag. For example, it found slash flag here. However, all of these are actually standard Linux things. These are actual, like, processor flags and different uh, configuration flags uh, for kernels and devices and stuff like that. So, no, no extra flags here. Um, and we wasted a good hour or so on this challenge just digging around the Docker container when it's actually so much more simple. So if we exit out of the container, Docker has a similar concept of history kind of like git commits do. And I started to think on the hint uh, that our princess was in another castle that maybe uh, the flag would exist in another version of the Docker container. So Docker has a great subcommand called history. So if we run docker tac tac help, we can see history and it shows the history of an image. So all the changes that were made to an image. So if we say docker history of who would ever guess this, we actually see it's been through four iterations. You can see one where we've added, they added a file uh, with bin uh, sh, one where they added uh, something with bash, and then here we go. Pico CTF, well, it isn't many points, 
and it's kind of cut off, right? And then now we see that, I'm sorry, but your princess is in another castle where they did that. Now, what's interesting about these uh, histories is normally this image uh, hash would let us start the image from a previous history, but all those hashes are missing, so we can't just boot up the old version of this Docker container. Instead, if you're not super familiar with all the subcommands in Docker, that's actually what this challenge is about. And <laughs> about the second hour in on, on poking our heads, or I guess I should say bashing our heads against this uh, challenge, we discovered that Docker history has a subcommand. So if you run Docker history, tac tac help, you'll receive all the uh, flags for this particular Docker subcommand. And one of them is dash dash no dash trunk which says don't truncate the output of the command. Okay, well maybe if we don't truncate the output, that's all that's wrong with this, right? So if we run docker history, tech no trunk, yep, that's exactly what the problem was. Super trivial, but they throw you for a loop by having you pull down the docker container. But all this really is is to kind of teach you uh, some container forensics, I guess, a little bit, and then also just teach you a little bit about Docker subcommands that themselves. And that's how you get the flag. Well, it isn't many points. What did you expect? And they're right. It was only 10 points, but 10 points well earned. So, Can You Guess Me was the next challenge. When you open Can You Guess Me, they ask you to download the game source and tell you that you can connect to a service running on port 12349 at that, at that domain name. So, let's dive into it. If we connect to canyouguessme.pony.ng at 12349, we're presented with a neat little prompt and we can type in whatever we want. Input value 8. Nope, better not look next time. So if we reconnect and type in something else, say, I don't know, a command, nope, no hacking. So just from some basic input fuzzing, we can see that some stuff is going on there. However, they are nice enough to give us the source code. So if we open up the source code, we can actually see what's going on here. So we have a try and catch conditional um, that is assumingly going to try to validate some kind of input. Um, and if we actually look through the try, the body of the try statement, we have a val equals zero, an input value that's ticking a user input, and then now we're actually counting digits uh, by getting the length of a set. If that is less than or equal to ten, we run an eval, and you just run it right on the input. Okay, so obviously this is trying to make sure it's a number, but it's not doing a very good job. It's not actually uh, checking for uh, valid type validation or anything like that. However, this is a try-catch conditional. And if you run an eval in Python and you're expecting it to uh, return a number, uh, in this case, this val is already set to zero and we're expecting it to return an integer, this exception will actually um, trigger and we'll get kicked out of uh, the rest of the input. However, we won't get kicked out of the input before our eval runs, so it seems like we can just start running eval stuff, right? Well, yeah. Um, as it turns out, you can, and there's, but there are a few caveats. Eval out of the box in Python doesn't just let you execute arbitrary commands. In other words, you can't just run ls uh, like we saw before. However, eval evaluates Python expressions, and Python expressions can also be Python code. So, you can do something like os.system if it's already imported and execute system commands that way. Uh, exec is actually built into Python's um, into Python's like standard libraries, I believe. So you can run exec right out of the gate. So you could do an eval on an exec call and run system commands that way. However, you're going to run into issues with length over time. Now, what's interesting about the set command, uh, now, as you can see here, this count digits equals the length of the set of input. Now, Python set actually extracts your input and creates a set. Now, for those of you who are familiar with some basic set theory, what this means is that it's going to take all the common characters and put them into a common set. So, if you had an exec, if you're if the parameters you pass uh, to your input was exec, you would get a set of e x c open parent close parent. You notice how we're missing another e there. Yeah, well, that's because E's already in the set. It doesn't need another E to account for, even though we input two E's. So even though the full character count of our exec is six, we only have five characters, which actually would bypass our count digits, in theory. However, we look a little bit closer at this uh, import up here. We have a standard 
from sys import exit and that's where we're uh, calling our exit call but then we also have this custom library from secret import secret value for password the flag and exec that's interesting we're importing a different exec okay so let's try to connect to the service here and let's execute exec we get a troll face and nope no hacking but as you can see that did work even though we hit this uh, accept conditional on the try catch um, it still actually did execute exec. The problem is we've overridden exec, so it's not um, the normal exec value. And we can actually test that by running a version of this command on our own here. So I'm just going to make a few modifications. We're going to have to get rid of this import statement because secret's not actually a thing on our on our side of the house. And we're also going to have to get rid of this secret valve for password. And we're going to make it, you know, something like leet. And print flag, you got the flag. And we're just doing this because we don't actually have those secret values or those flags, right? So we're going to write that. And then we're actually going to run our custom version of this script here. So it's actually Python 3. And can you guess me? Pi. Now, if we enter exec on our systems, it gives us a nope, no hacking. But if we run just like an exec on the eval, it says nope, better not look next time. But as you can see, it doesn't cause us any real issues here. And if we drop into a Python interpreter and run exec, we can see we need at least one argument. So it actually uh, caused an error. So if we exit here, run our thing again, and then say exec ls, we still get a nope, no hacking. But that's very different from the output that we see uh, when we connect to the service, right? Uh, and if we were to in input our secret value of 1337, we would get a, a different, we would of course get the flag, but we don't know what the secret value is. So we know execs being funny, but it could just be because we're breaking character limits. In fact, if I say print hello, this won't work because I know we should be going over 10 characters. However, if I do this again and I say print you know, 12, we actually did print 12. So it actually executed our print in our eval. So let's connect to that service and see if we get the same kind of response. And we do. So now we can start playing around with other functions. So we know exec doesn't work because they've essentially overrode it. And we can't execute system commands easily because of the length restriction. However, there are some other commands that we can run. So actually, a teammate of mine found out that you could execute print successfully when connecting to that service. So the th next thing I did was actually Google get info about commands in Python. And I found this little wiki page for Python programming self-help. And there's actually a couple of uh, different programs that will help you do stuff. So I started with dir, even though, and which was weird enough because I skipped help. <laughs> and you'll see why that's silly here soon. But I started with dir and then eventually got to help. So if you run dir, you actually get... A list of attributes in um, that are being made use of in the current context of the program. So if we try to execute dir on its own, we get a note better luck next time. But if we actually print out dir, which is what we figured out that we had to start doing, uh, print would actually give us our output back. So it wasn't just returning uh, our standard out. So we actually have to print the result or the the returned object of the function. In this case, dir is going to return a list. And when you do that, it actually works. And you can see here's all of the uh, variables and built-in functions and things that we have ac access to. So we've got val, secret value for password, input, flag, exit, etc. So now you're thinking, oh, well, if you can just run print, why not just print the values of, like, flag? Well, it catches you there. And if we try to print the value of secret value for password, this is actually just going to be too many characters, which is why we can't do it. But we can try. And that didn't work either. But we can see that is, this would actually work in theory if we print val, which we do have access to. It says, nope, better luck next time. But we can actually go look at a source code here and see that val is indeed zero when it's initialized. And it was zero uh, at the time of us uh, printing that statement. Okay, so we got dir. The next thing I did was just to get information about functions. So if we know that we have access to exec and 
flag and input, secret value, password. We can run help on those and see if there's actually any information. So if you run help on exec, it just says that it's uh, help on function exec module and secret. It tells us that it takes an arg uh, and kw args, which doesn't give us a whole lot of information. But if we maybe say print help on flag, maybe flag is a, a, a function of some sort. Oops, sorry. Not print help on flag. If we say help on flag, it's, we get a no Python documentation found for, oh, <laughs> so hmm, you were able to golf it down. Here, have a flag. So this appears to be a result of, even though there's no doc, a formal documentation or doc string for the function, uh, the result of that is that whatever the name of this function was or the name of this um, variable was, instead gives us the uh, output of it since there's no formal dot string. So this was actually the value of the flag. That took a little bit of poking around, but I really enjoyed that challenge because it provided some constraints that made you look up some internal functions of Python to just explore around. Now there's obviously other ways such as uh, I think globals and locals which are commands which should give you values of lo global and local variables but you'll find that those actually didn't work on this challenge. So help was just in, uh, learning about the help function and reading doc strings was just the key to poking around this challenge. Just really obscure random things and that's what I love about CTFs is it makes you dive down rabbit holes that you wouldn't have normally dove, dove down otherwise. So that got us another 100 points, bringing us to our total of 111 points for the entire thing, and we never solved anything else. We played a lot around with plat splat Cypress, splat Birch, Potent Quotables, Space Saver, Are You Sad? Um, we got some great guys on our team that are really good at crypto and, and forensics and stuff like that, but we just weren't able to, to compete with the best this year. So we're going to keep trying, keep training, and moving along. But I hope you all learned something from these challenges just like we did, and I'm looking forward to playing again next year. Catch you guys later.